So good morning and welcome everyone to this Knowledge Rights 21 webinar on the study on copyright and distance education and research, exploring the role of copyright in facilitating access to digital collections of libraries and other public interest institutions. And I'm really glad to welcome Ordani Sadowskaite here today from Visionary Analytics to talk about it. Very quickly to introduce Knowledge Rights 21, if you're not already available, um, we are a campaign that was set up in order to address, as I said on the screen, the incomplete and fragmented approach often taken to enabling access to research, education and culture in Europe. And in particular to do this, to make sure that the voices of the libraries and of the researchers, the educators, the students, the readers that they support are actually heard in these discussions, to make sure that discussions around copyright and around information regulation in general, focus on what actually delivers, what actually delivers on these pretty key fundamental rights in the 21st century. We do this through carrying out research, trying to fill in some of the evidence gaps around copyright and information law, and through supporting a network of great national coordinators who look to build networks to bring people with, together within their countries, but also trying to make sure at the European level within Brussels, we are engaging with decision makers bringing these experiences, these needs to their attention and really engaging in trying to make sure that the European policy process provides a really great framework for what happens nationally and really provides that reassurance possibilities that we need. Crucially, the question that, that we're looking at today and the question that the, the, the survey that, that Odroni is going to talk about looks at is that of how far the current copyright and their copyright regime, so the rules around copyright, around exceptions to copyright, around licensing and more, how far does that enable remote access to and use of the collections of libraries and other public interest institutions in order to support research and education? And this is an issue that was clearly very strongly highlighted during the period of COVID, but is certainly not going away. Habits have changed. We've realised the importance, the need to make sure that it, where you are based, how mobile you are, the budget you have, shouldn't necessarily be a restriction on your ability to carry out research, to benefit from education, to participate in cultural life. So in terms of what we're going to do today, it's a very simple agenda. We've only got an hour. Um, this is the introduction. It will be over very shortly. And then we'll have the presentation of the visionary analytic studies by the study by Odoni Sadovskaya, and um, both the survey and some exciting work around some case studies. So please be listening in, paying attention. There may be other ways in which you can contribute. And then we'll have some time for questions and answers at the end. And the goal is that you feel that you can really contribute to this survey fully to make sure that your experiences, the experiences of the people that you serve are reflected in this, that we get the maximum possible response rate to the survey to really help there, and that we help Audrani and her team and her collaborators really produce a document that can be a real landmark in the work of the next commission that's coming in later this year. So, oh, I'm going to go back. So I'm actually going to, that is the introduction over. I'm very happy, therefore, to um, invite Audrani to take the floor. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand over to you so we get maximum time with you. Audrani. Thank you so much, Stephen, for the wonderful uh, introduction. And uh, thank you, everyone, for taking the time to, you know, on a Friday morning to listen in, to participate. So we're really grateful for, for your engagement. Uh, and yes, uh, without further ado, let me just present uh, the study that we are running. Uh, first and foremost, my name is Odrana Sadovskaita. Uh, I do represent Visionary Analytics. We're based in Vilnius, Lithuania. We are a private research institute. And what we do, we focus on um, evidence-based uh, policy research. Uh, mostly we work for the, Euro for the European Commission. We work almost exclusively with uh, public institutions, also national governments providing independent uh, research on key policy issues. I do uh, specialize in uh, digital policies. I am a political scientist trained in public policy analysis methods. But of course, for this particular study, we do have a big team comprised of also copyright lawyers, sociologists, economists, uh, political scientists, because as you will see, the study is quite huge and uh, covers a lot of different angles and aspects and, and whatnot. Um, we are collaborating with uh, a couple of partners uh, on this project, so including Eparis, OK Consulting and uh, KEA um, that are boosting our um, team. Let me move on to the next slide. Right, so the objective uh, of the study is quite straightforward, as uh, Stephen has already presented. It is to explore the copyright aspects that are related to the making available of works in digital format by 
public interest institutions. And what we mean by that, uh, we mean schools, universities, research institutes, uh, also all kinds of cultural heritage institutions. So libraries, museums, archives, audiovisual heritage institutions and so forth. Um, we're also exploring um, the use of these um, copyrighted, copyright protected materials for educational and research purposes. Uh, what is also important to note that this is a pilot project, the proposal that came from uh, the European Parliament and our studies aimed at supporting it. Now, a couple of slides uh, quickly, hopefully on the scope of the study so that you get a better picture of what kind of issues we're dealing with here. Uh, the study focuses on three domains. So within one, um, one research report, we're aiming to cover education, research and cultural heritage. And of course, these domains really heavily differ in their user base. So for example, for education, uh, this concerns students, teachers, for research, this concerns uh, researchers. But then we're also looking at the general public, so, you know, uh, people who use library services, just lend books, go to museums uh, to get access to, to knowledge, um, et cetera. These domains also differ in the works that are most used. So for example, for education, textbooks are particularly uh, important um, for research. Usually um, there's a very important issue of access to manuscripts and published documents uh, held in archives, for example, um, trade books, uh, are, is also a different sort of uh, animal uh, compared to scientific um, research articles, scientific books. Audiovisual material obviously has its own um, particularities as well. The domains also differ in their uses of the work provided. So that's really relevant in the framework of the copyright. So basically what kind of exceptions and limitations are applicable to the use of the work. Uh, that's very technical and very legal, but it's uh, it's it's an added layer of complexity in the study that we're working on. The relationships between the PIIs, I will use this abbreviation, so public interest institutions, the relationships between them and right holders also uh, differ quite uh, significantly in the educational domain versus the research domain versus the cultural heritage domain. And of course, the legal rules and contractual practices also vary uh, in, these, in these domains. Now, the study is basically built um, conceptually around the activities of public interest institutions. And very broadly speaking, there are two uh, areas that we look into. So firstly, what are the practices around building digital collections or acquiring digital content? So whether institutions choose to obtain ownership of materials or whether they go for licensing for one reason or another, including open licensing, uh, or whether they opt to use materials on the basis of copyright exceptions. The second huge group of activities that we're looking into is how do PIIs provide access for their end users? So whether they engage in lending activities, um, whether they whether the users actually share, copy the materials or engage in any other activities, for example, including remote and cross-border activities, which is a very hot and difficult topic uh, uh, at the moment. Uh, and of course, by users, we do mean, again, teachers, students, researchers, and general users of cultural heritage content. Uh, now, an important point to note that the study is framed around issues related to PII activities, but we do also consider all relevant viewpoints. So the rights holders viewpoint is quite important, but also the policymakers, since they set the framework within, within which the institutions operate in, the users are also particularly relevant for us to reach out to. Now, the point of the slide is not for you to be able to read all of the fine print in detail, but rather just to illustrate the complexity of the ecosystem and the amount of actors and interactions that actually take place within that ecosystem. But it's quite clear that uh, at the center of it are the public interest institutions. So the museums, the libraries, the archives, the schools, um, the research institutions. And there's a lot going on here. There's a lot of uh, different interactions between PIIs and right holders. Uh, collective management organizations are a really important actor since they do provide collective licenses to, to PAIs, but also policymakers that, as I said, set the regulatory framework within which uh, 
all of the actors have to uh, operate in. So not to dwell on this too much, let me uh, move to presenting the methodology and the timeline of the study and the different activities that we're actually doing uh, within it. Uh, in short, the study is comprised of four tasks. We are done with task one and are in the middle of tasks two and three. Uh, I will present all of these tasks, tasks a bit more in uh, detail in the next slides, but actually there are two activities from which would really benefit from your contributions, as Stephen has already mentioned. So the ongoing large-scale survey, which I will talk about a bit more, but also we have just recently uh, agreed on the list of 12 case studies, which will focus on really practical examples on specific institutions on specific countries, what types of challenges and opportunities they face. So I will share those topics with you. And if you have experiences that are relevant to those and would like to participate, it could be really great to hear from you either today or as a follow up to, to this uh, webinar. Uh, I see that there's uh, something in the chat but i will only be able to peruse it after the presentation um that, 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 that's fine it's just a request to people to put their questions in the q a function so that's okay perfect thank you so much stephen uh so task one was a comprehensive mapping sort of to take stock uh, uh of the of the baseline of the rules of the game and of the ecosystem uh, that was executed late last year early this year and the topics that were addressed by this first task um, we're producing an overview of the ecosystem, sort of a conceptual framework to map the relevant actors, the relevant interactions that the study must take into account. Uh, then we produced an overview of EU and national copyright framework. There was a sample of 15 member states that was discussed and agreed with the commission that the study can focus on. So basically that was a, um, an overview of the applicable copyright exceptions and limitations for those three domains. Then we looked into typical national licensing practices and processes for those 15 EU member states. How do they differ across the domain? So what are the most prevalent practices in these countries in terms of licensing educational content versus cultural uh, content for museums, uh, etc. Then what we also did was uh, we looked into the policies and practices of PAIs for building and developing their collections. So we reviewed existing literature and sort of mapped out uh, a first baseline for our next activities there. Uh, we did the same uh, with the mapping of remote services that PAIs provide to users and the technical solutions underpinning these. So these are things like how do libraries uh, organize e-lending, interlibrary loans, document exchange specifically for that are relevant for research? Uh, how do like how do educational institutions set up remote uh, educate remote environments for educational content and so on and so forth? Uh, very briefly, a couple of words on the methods. Um, as I said, we focused on a sample of fifteen EU countries. Within this task, we conducted 117 interviews with the public interest institutions, with right holders, with national authorities, with academic experts. 100 of these were done at the national level and 17 of these were done with EU level organizations uh, representing the different stakeholders. Of course, there was extensive desk research and literature review and a first stakeholder workshop at the end of March 2024. Now task two uh, aims to identify challenges and opportunities that public interest institutions face in, in making content available for education and research. Um, so uh, the timeline is sort of split into two um, phases. The first phase focused on desk research and workshop, and that was uh, what we were working on in February through the uh, end of June, whereas the survey um, was launched late uh, June, early July, and we will uh, work on it until the end of August, since we hope that there's going to be a lot of data to analyze for us over the summer. Uh, the topics that are addressed within these tasks uh, really re revolve around the different types of challenges and opportunities. So first and foremost, legal, whether there's any issues related to scope and in, in national implementations or EU level, um, let's say uh, EU level text of copyright exceptions and limitations, we're taking stock of that. Uh, then we're looking into challenges related to possible tensions and how the interests of key stakeholders are preserved. So basically to put it simply, it boils down to 
uh, the need to access content and to make knowledge available for education and research versus commercial concerns and uh, fair remuneration concerns. Uh, then what we are also looking at is cooperation opportunities within and across stakeholder groups. So as, as one of many examples, do public interest institutions collaborate, for example, um, form consortia for negotiating with right holders for better licensing terms to boost their uh, bargaining power, since we know that this is, uh, this is a big issue in the ecosystem. Or perhaps there are collaborations between right holders and PAIs to make content available for, for, for users. And then last but not least, there's various practical challenges and opportunities, including technology related issues, resources, which I know that is a very uh, a very big sticking point for public interest institutions, whether it be financial, know-how, knowledge-related um, resource um, challenges. So here the methods, very briefly, are again desk research and literature review, but for this task specifically, we're really paying very close attention to stakeholder positions, since there's a lot of uh, position papers, research done by the different stakeholder groups, we're really taking stock of that here. Uh, over the course of May, we had three workshops specifically focusing on PIIs. Uh, we had one workshop per domain where stakeholders were brought together to discuss what are the key challenges for them um, in education, research, and cultural heritage domain, respectively. And the stakeholder surveys, uh, which I would like to shed some light on now. So the large scale survey has four distinct target groups and we have four separate questionnaires running in parallel. So uh, the two key target groups are public interest institutions. So as I mentioned, schools, universities, libraries, museums, archives, audiovisual heritage institutions. Then a second major target group are end users. So here we're looking to get insights from students, from educators, whether it be school teachers or university lecturers researchers, but also library, museum, or archive patrons. We also have two surveys aimed at right holders and policymakers, uh, respectively. Uh, if you have engaged with the survey, I'm sure you've noticed that it is quite extensive and covers quite a lot of issues. So I have to say in advance, really, we appreciate so much the effort that you have already put into the survey. Uh, we have tried to make the questionnaires as dynamic as possible, so to filter the questions that so that you only see a relevant set of questions. If you do have experience with a particular issue, but still, I'm aware that the survey is quite long, but um, we try to focus it as much as possible, considering the very broad scope of the study. There's very little amount of questions that are mandatory, so you actually can just skip some questions if you don't know how to answer them, but any amount of questions that you're able to answer will still be relevant since we will be taking partial responses into account as well, because there's space for open text just to share your experiences. We'll be really taking stock of every single response that's coming in. The survey is anonymous. We will only be analyzing the survey responses by country and by type of institution, making sure that, especially if there's some sensitive, sensitive issues uh, presented to us, that it's fully anonymized. And we would really encourage you to participate by uh, July 15th, if you are able. Again, it's not a great timing for surveys, we're well aware, but we're just trying to make this push by mid-July to see where we are then. I actually do have two general survey links here, but I saw that Stephen has some QR codes, so perhaps it's better that Stephen projects the slide where you can uh, scan that QR code instead of using these links. Uh, but just to briefly comment on the content of those surveys, uh, for the PII um, for the PII questionnaire, you'll see questions around acquiring works and building collections. So do you opt to uh, purchase content or uh, obtain licenses? If licenses, what kind? Direct licensing with individual rights holders, whether collective licenses. Do you use works in the public domain? Do you use orphan works, out of commerce works? Uh, etc. Of course, we will ask you about challenges related to licensing, because we are aware that there is a lot uh, to say in that area. Uh, digitization of works and the practices around that are really relevant. If that's relevant to your institution, we'd be happy to see your experiences with that. 
um, a big chunk of the questionnaire focuses on remote making works accessible remotely to end users. Remote is in brackets because even though the majority of um, topics that we're investigating revolve things such as e-lending, interlibrary loans, remote access for remote services for education and research, but there are a couple of questions on on-site consultation uh, and use of um, dedicated terminals on premises, uh, since these are also within the scope of the EU copyright exceptions and limitations. Uh, there are also sections on your experiences with cross-border activities, whether it be teaching it or, or research or just general uh, cultural uh, preservation and dissemination activities, and a section where you can share your thoughts on opportunities for improvements. Uh, the user survey has questions, uh, again, very similarly around challenges related to copyright and typical teaching, learning, or research activities, whatever is relevant to you. Uh, again, remote access to works for these uh, teaching, learning, or research activities. Then we have sections on whether you have experiences with technical protection measures, so things like digital locks, pass password protect, uh, protected access, any kind of measures that are aimed at limiting the potential uh, unlawful uh, dissemination of works and whether that creates obstacles to, let's say, your research, um, and also whether you have any experiences in cross-border activities, whether it be international research projects or some, some sort of educational activities or cultural activities. Uh, now I will try to slightly speed through uh, task three, which uh, is which are the 12 case studies. Uh, we are currently working on four out of eight of those. I will tell you a bit more about those uh, in a second. Uh, all of the 12 case studies are based on a mixed methods research. So we will be combining interviews with survey data, with desk research, statistical and graphical analysis, some field visits where institutions are willing and able uh, to, let's say, host us so that we come and speak to them in person. Uh, also analysis of very specific use cases. So for example, what challenges do, does a particular research in a particular country in a particular institution face, let's say, when trying to conduct research and what are the challenges related to, for example, technical protection measures. Uh, I would like to preface the next slides by saying that these are case studies, so they are really aimed at being illustrative and not exhaustive. So these will be limited in terms of either the countries that we will be focusing on or topics or questions or particular institutions. Uh, so, uh, we have 12 case studies. We're currently working on these four. Uh, the first one uh, revolves around the practical applications of the European Court of Justice in the VOB decision related to e-lending. E e so, this is, of course, a, a big case study, a, a very relevant one, uh, which will be comprised of, of course, an overview of the state of play, which will be the legislative, licensing, and market state of play in Europe. There's a lot of very good research done already there. Uh, then we will do a deeper dive into the licensing agreements and barriers to e-lending in three countries that was discussed under, uh, with the Commission. We will also investigate social, cultural and economic impacts of e-lending. We will also aim to assess possible measures to increase the prevalence of e-lending and also assess the impact of extension of e-lending schemes. The second case study uh, focuses on the services of PIIs in times of crisis. Sorry, my lighting decided to do its own thing. So, of course, uh, there were a lot of challenges that public interest institutions faced in, in the times of COVID, as Stephen has mentioned. So we aim to take stock of, of the nature of these challenges and also to explore what were the measures to mitigate those? What was the effectiveness of those measures? What were the best practices? So of course, uh, there, was, there will be also an added focus on whether there were temporary or permanent, let's say, measures to increase digital availability of content. Uh, we will aim to focus our analysis on three countries. So far, we have identified good practices in a couple of those countries that you can see on the screen. But if you have experiences, please to share. We will we will be happy to, to consider them and uh, include them in our research. There are also questions on this in the survey, so you can also share your experiences. The third case study, as I've already hinted at, aims at assessing what are the challenges created by technological protection measures for education and research. So of course the case study will include uh, uh, 
an, a legal framework uh, overview uh, concerning application of uh, technological protection measures. Then we will also take stock of measures from right holders and measures at the member state level, if there are any, to facilitate, let's say, unlocking the TPMs uh, for the purposes of education and research. What are the on the ground practices there? We will focus on use cases from specific researchers, specific educators, and the barriers that they face in their day to day educational and research activities with technological protection measures. We will also um, outline the impacts of these TPM related barriers for research and education, because we know that this is a really, uh, sometimes it can pose a really big challenge, especially for research. And there the focus will also be on three countries. Now, case study four is focused on cross-border research and document exchange for research purposes in uh, cross-national contexts. So there we will again be diving into the practical needs and challenges of specific researchers and research institutions in cross-national research contexts. And here we have a specific horizon project from which we will be uh, interviewing researchers and research institutions and a university alliance uh, that we will also draw from uh, when we build focus groups to get access to these researchers and institutions. Now, the remaining eight case studies, we have topics confirmed, but we're still discussing the scope uh, with the commission. So uh, you can take the topics for granted, but the specific questions and nuances that we'll, we will be able to cover are still under discussion. The fifth case study will be focusing on the public domain and specifically on use and reuse of public domain works by public interest institutions for the purposes of research, education, and uh, preservation. We know that the Italian case, of course, is uh, really prominent uh, in this area. So we will be looking uh, at also the interaction between copyright law and cultural heritage law uh, applicable to cultural heritage institutions. We're still discussing the country focus, uh, the, the scope of the case study. The sixth case study will focus on education, specifically uh, reuse of copyright protected content for educational purposes. So we will be aiming to take stock of the challenges that teachers or creators face when reusing copyright protected, protected content in the content that they make available online. So what they put up for massive open online courses, what they put up as their class recordings, what they put up for in, as the, in the digital learning environments. Uh, this will also include exploration of challenges in cross-border contexts. We'll also be looking to see what mechanisms are available for teachers and creators to actually obtain the authorizations for, uh, for this use and reuse of work where this is not covered by an exception. Uh, we'll also specifically look into whether open license and public domain works are more easily reusable or whether there are still some specific challenges in reusing these works as well, and any other specific challenge uh, for the use of cultural heritage material in the classroom. Uh, then case study seven, very briefly, will specifically focus on implementation of the new rules and the DSM directive on out-of-commerce work. So, what, what are the experiences of public interest institutions with these new provisions? What are the licensing practices? Whether um, right holders are making use of the reservation protocol in the context of text and data mining? Whether there's any experiences with stakeholder dialogue as foreseen in the DSM directive? Um, and so on and so forth. Now, case study eight will also focus on the secondary publication rights. We are aware that there was a massive study conducted on, for the DG research uh, technology, research and innovation, DGRTD. So this will just sort of scratch the surface of the economic impacts of secondary publication rights. So what are the impacts on the scientific publishing market? What are the possible impacts of SPR on research institutions, researchers? What are any other possible effects of introducing a secondary publication right? So, for example, would it foster more open access? Uh, would it create or would it remove any other barriers in the research ecosystem? That one is a, it's a really complex one, I have to, I have to admit. The last four case study topics um, 
His study nine will focus on access and reuse of protected content in public and private partnerships. So basically we will be looking into the role of copyright and exploitation of research results in the context of public-private partnerships. So for example, what are the practices of granting or transferring of rights to or between research project partners? These could be spin-offs, these could be other already existing companies that are participating in those partnerships, other public interest institutions, investors, innovation support agencies, uh, and so on. Uh, to do so, we will focus on uh, a handful example public-private partnerships from either Horizon 2020 or Horizon Europe projects and see what were the IP management strategies uh, in these contexts to mitigate all of the challenges and take stock of opportunities for knowledge transfer. Case study 10 is one that I'm really excited about. It's uh, use of library collections for training AI models. So what is the role of libraries or archives or museum in, museums in developing AI models? What are the possible copyright issues? So for example, text and data mining, is are these library models used for non-commercial TDM or commercial TDM as well? We know that there's a lot of pushback from rights holders in that area. Uh, to do so, we will focus on selected cultural heritage institutions with relevant experiences. And currently we have identified some examples from from a couple of countries, but if you have some uh, experiences, uh, please give us a shout. We'd be happy to reach out to you and listen to, to what were your experiences here. Uh, case study 11 will focus on contractual practices and licensing conditions bet between rights holders on the one hand and public interest institutions on the other hand to offer access to works. So the relevant questions are, what are the are there any contractual terms and clauses specifically related to copyright that would limit institutions in offering access to content and knowledge? But are there any unfair contract practices that are prohibiting institutions from giving access to content? And this case study will focus on a few illustrative examples of contractual clauses to really drill down to the very practical problem and to illustrate it. The last case study will focus on liability risks for public interest institutions in relation to copyright protected content. So here we will aim to identify the risks that institutions take when ma making copyright content available. So whether these are legal risks, reputational risks, financial risks, and what are, more, most importantly, what are the effects of these risks on the daily functioning of institutions? We will aim to see whether there are any best practices that we could spread for assessing and mitigating these risks. Um, we'll also aim to identify a couple of very illustrative examples of legal disputes that did expose public interest institutions to copyright liability claims. And to do so, we will again focus on a few institutions to really deep, really deeply into their experiences. Just a couple of very last few slides. Uh, so task four will aim to take stock of all of the evidence collected in the previous activities that I have presented to you. Uh, and it will culminate in the final report. So from our side, we aim to present uh, the final report to the commission by end of 2024, November. But uh, the publication from the commission side is aimed at, at early 2025, since it does take a bit of time to actually get the publication out there. Thank you so much for listening to the presentation. I'm eager to open the chat and have a look uh, at the comments and questions there. Again, if you would like to reach out after this webinar, you can see my email address here. Really looking forward to hearing from you and thank you again for your attention. Thank you very much. And, and uh, there's a hell of a lot in there. And, and I think I, I've, I have looked through those those surveys. And in fact, one thing that we will be doing is producing a sort of PDF version so you can actually look through the entire survey. And I, I warn everyone, they are at least 16 pages each. So that there's a lot in there, but hopefully by, by sharing that, that makes it easier for people to look through. Um, there were a couple of immediate questions in the chat. I've got a couple which will hopefully make things clearer for people. But as I said, please do use the chat, use the Q&A function to ask for any further information. So um, one question is, um, is the survey only for EU member states? 
you're muted. There you go. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Um, so the survey uh, is actually aimed at 15 EU member states, which is in line with the scope of task one that we selected, but we are taking also responses from other EU member states. We are focusing on the EU, but if someone from outside of outside of uh, the EU27 still within Europe would like to contribute, we will still uh, really very much appreciate your answer because these perspectives are particularly uh, telling sometimes for comparative uh, purposes. Uh, a note will a note is just to say that um, we focus our dissemination efforts on these EU15 member states and that's you will see the translations are only provided for those 15 EU member states so that was the reason. But in short, please do respond if uh, you're also outside of the EU, but still in Europe. And, and uh, I think there's there's at least one question that talks about the value of making it easier to carry out cross border research and education anywhere in the world, as well. So I know there's, it's one point on like page thirteen or something like that. But but that that role is that that potential is recognised in there. Um, exactly. A, a second question. Um, was will the presentation be available after the webinar? We're obviously recording this, but if you're happy to share the the, the PowerPoint or as a PDF, then that would be very welcome. I think. Absolutely, uh, I can share it with you, Stephen. If if you can then make it available to the participants, that would be perfect for sure. Fantastic. So, um, then there's a question from. I, I should let you read the question. But I just wanted to make sure I cover the ones higher up. So. <laughs> Uh, in terms of the follow-up from the study, uh, what I can say is that at the moment the study is not particularly tied to any legislative initiative, but the Commission will um, use the knowledge in further policy development. But at the moment there's no very specific, let's say, initiative that the study is tied to. This is quite exploratory in nature. This is quite broad. It's really difficult to attach it to one specific, let's say, uh, policy initiative. So that's that's as much as I can say on the, the vision of policymakers. Uh, I can't really, can't really say much at, at this stage. I, I don't think that there is anything no, no, very no. specific in the works, or at least we're not made to privy to that yet. <laughs> no, 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 I, th I think, well, I think that there's, there's something interesting about the timing is, is, I don't know, this is absolutely not, this is not down to visionary. This is down to, to, to issues elsewhere that, I don't know, this work was started a lot later than everyone was expecting. And so originally the idea was that this would have been ready a year, a couple of years ago or something like that. It wasn't fair enough that happens. But what it does mean is that this is going to land just at the time that people are really getting up to speed. There will be a new commission that will have been in place a priori for two or three months. And and, and so actually the timing will be interesting in terms of actually feeding into feeding into broader questions. Um, we've got another question from Maya in the chat. Mm -hmm. the, the... Let me just... Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Maya, for, for that question. Uh, I would say that this is what you mentioned is at the, at the heart of the case study. So exactly um, what are the concerns from libraries or other PIIs uh, related to fears, let's say, of copyright liability. So um, unless you would like to specify a specific element that you think is excluded from that case study, but the way that I read the, the case study topic is it, these fears of copyright liability are the risks that we will expect libraries to, to share with us and talk about. You know, just potentially what while Maya's writing, I I know that one reaction I had when looking through is that one of the other responses that that many libraries may find themselves putting in is and there's liability, but I think I don't know just more explicitly that the fear of being pursued, the fear of having a lawyer knock on the door to do mm -hmm. things, and, and and this can be both because libraries are being offered contracts that um actually try and take away things that they should be able to do. Um, I know it's an issue that we see within the open access space that even when you have a secondary publishing right in place, even when there's rights retention, 
the contract offered may actually to to to, to, to authors may actually try to take that away um which is of course troubling when people are trying to offer contracts that are actually potentially not legal <laughs> so i think those sorts of clarities and i think recognizing that that libraries tend to be and have to be quite cautious about risk a lot of the time mm -hmm. thank you so much for sharing that that's precisely what that case study is aimed at so I guess I, I, I had a, a couple of questions just to um to, to to throw in on this. So I think a, a number of times you ask questions about what libraries do with their collections and do libraries sort of provide remote access to their collections. And I think a, a lot of time, a lot of the time, the answer is going to be it depends or sometimes or something like that. Um, in, in those situations, should they say yes, they can do it, or or no, they can't? Is there a way of being clear about saying, well, some things you can share and some things you can work with, but it's not everything because collections aren't uniform. That's true. That's true. Uh, if you are specifically referring to the survey and the way that let's say libraries should approach the the survey, uh, there are spaces for open elaboration. So. Specifically, if you find yourself in a situation where a question, let's say, is a bit ambiguous in terms of it depends, you can please feel free to use these open spaces to specify whether you know it uh, applies to a specific type of work that libraries hold in, hold in their collection, because we will really be scrutinizing the the uh, survey answers in the context of the other questions. It's not going to be just like a brutal mechanic you know, quantitative analysis. That's why we really do foresee a lot of time for the survey analysis. So please feel free to make use of the open uh, open spaces in the, in the survey to specify. Thank you. And I think that that, that, that it, it, it's a really important point that actually, yes, so you've obviously given tick boxes or check boxes as a way of making a survey less difficult to fill in. And, and open questions are harder, but actually the open questions really encourage and it's really good to hear that that you will be looking very much at the responses to those open questions that those will have a big a big impact um absolutely i know that yeah and myers provides a little bit more 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 detail on on the comment and and that yes that that risk of, of chilling of trying to imply that something isn't legal again i, I know that we are seeing and, and we're seeing a reaction to the tendency of rights holders to try and say no you can't use this work to train AI, even when the even when the text and data mining involved, the AI involved is entirely public sector. And so that does have that that that, that obviously has has an impact. And we've seen statements by ICOL and we've seen statements by others about this 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 sort of harmful practice that is that is seems to be taking place right now. I suppose a, another um hopefully a clarification question that will help people in in responding. Um, I guess I know we're always quite trying to be quite careful about distinguishing between access and use. Um, the fact of being able to read something isn't necessarily the ability to actually use it. Now, I think within the with, with, within the survey, you have very much section two, if I remember it correctly, is is more about how do you acquire, and obviously acquiring. It's not actually owning half the time. It's it's especially in the digital world. It's mainly about actually just getting a license, and then section three is about acquiring for education or access for education. I, I suppose that's actually the section that that talks more about use because I don't. Know, I think a, a concern, and this is within the open access space more broadly, is that often you can have access to something, but actually the subsequent possibilities are so limited that it's not actually helpful for lending, it's not helpful for education, it's not helpful for research. So just to clarify, it's very much, I don't know, the word access is used both to mean access to read and to use, that's correct? Uh, the uh, interpretation that you offered that the, the first section, which talks about acquiring content and building collections, would mean access in the sense that you've presented it. So the availability to read content, whereas the subsequent sections does speak about the use in the way that you've termed it. So being able to use that particular piece of content for research, for education, so lend it out, um, et cetera. So 
both of these things are covered in the survey, but indeed the first part talks more about acquiring, let's say having access to a specific work in the collection of a PAI, but the use aspect is covered by, by the remote services portion of the survey. Thank you. And again, it's, it's, it's a clarifying question. And I hope that that, that that makes it easy. I'm just having a quick look at the. So I have a couple more questions, but I'm asking these primarily actually so that anyone who's listening has an opportunity also to stop and think. Although I think also as um, Lee, you have Odwane's email on the screen and if there are questions that come up when, when you read through the thing, that's also important. Um, you, you did obviously mention um, the RTD uh, study and I've put a, a link to that in, in the chat as well. Um, obviously that had a, a very high um, response rate amongst researchers and obviously the questions aren't the same and, and it comes from a slightly different perspective but that did nonetheless sort of make recommendations about what from the point of view of the research community and, and, and of publishers or different type of publishers was actually desirable and, and what would be helpful. How do you see your study interacting with that? There'll be sort of strong cross-reference within their are there elements of the RTD study that you can actually draw from? Uh, that's a very good question, Stephen. And uh, indeed, uh, as you mentioned, this study touched upon part of the issues that we that are within the scope of our study. The results came out quite uh, quite recently. There will be a very strong cross reference with the with the RTD study, since indeed we don't need to duplicate research efforts where there was a um, something done. Um, Pretty, pretty recently on the specific elements that we will be drawing on the study. Uh, this is not exhaustive, but certainly for the secondary publication rights case study, we're really heavily drawing on that study as a baseline. Of course, checking um, the evidence base for all of the statements made that, that, that are made in, in that study to see if it's robust enough for us to carry over. That's one element that we will be really heavily drawing on. Of course, our case study is will not replace in any sort of way a feasibility study on secondary publication, right, and expanding that. It will really just be focusing on one, on one aspect, on the economic, uh, on uncovering the economic impacts to the ecosystem, to the research ecosystem. Uh, but again, other elements of the DGRTD study will be cross-referenced in our study um, going beyond the secondary publication, right? Great. No, no, no that, that, that's extremely good to hear. As I know, of course, I don't know, <laughs> obviously the other study had the advantage of, of putting out its survey not in the summer. <laughs> that's I'm true. Kind of conscious <laughs> that deadlines are deadlines and, and, and that's how it works. I'm sure you will get requests for extensions, especially from the Nordic countries where everyone went on leave from about the 23rd onwards and isn't back until August. Um, that's true. I think that there's a um two two questions from Maya and and I don't know one which I think I also felt was um it was helpful. I think one I guess criticism perhaps that we had of the um the DGRTD study and in particular its look at um um secondary publishing rights was when it talked about economic impact. This was only defined in terms of I don't know claimed perceived harm to specific business models uh, and it was already very positive when you talk about the the economic impact of secondary publishing rights that you're not just talking about um I don't know, you're not just talking about the impact on on whatever business models are currently being used and and whether someone they might actually need to change business models you're also talking about the interests of, of researchers i suppose that does lead to the question of um i don't know the the end goal that we have in mind, and as it's in the study, it's the title of the thing that it, it, it is the end goal to assess how far it, it is the goal to maximize access for research, access for education, access for the cultural participation, which I think is a slightly less sort of, I don't know, <laughs> it's a different way of describing it than just leisure. Um, and, 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 and I think, I don't know, how do we get out of that? How, how far is it going to be focus on providing these goals or will we just get back to the old copyright thing of thinking well we always need balance regardless of what the actual ultimate end policy goal might be uh, I think Maya might have explained it better in her question e than that, so do take a look I wanted to I, yeah I, I do feel like that 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 is uh going along the same lines uh, as the, the the question that Maya mentioned mm. 
I'll just take a second to read through. Of course. Right. Can if I understand the question correctly, uh, basically is whether we can estimate whether the best practices will be focusing on what works best for PIIs or whether the practices will be what works best for right holders. Um, from our side, um, we don't particularly have, since the study, maybe my answer will be twofold. One element of this is that the study is not attached to a specific policy change or policy outcome. So it's really difficult. Also for us, we're not the policy makers ourselves. We don't really set the normative policy goals, what we're aiming for. So I cannot really say much more on that just because the, the study is exploratory in nature. But on the other hand, uh, the goal of the study is to first and foremost, make sure that there's um, the perspectives of PIIs are heard because we have really been, that that was the feedback that we got early on in the study from one of the first engagements uh, with the stakeholders that we had. So there is a very clear focus to, to seeing what works for the public interest institutions and not only what works for rights holders, since rights holders are much better sort of organized. They usually have more negotiation power and their voices are really well heard usually. So that's one thing that I can say in terms of recommending, we won't be recommending any, um, or rather we might recommend policy change, but it's not necessarily that the commission is committed to making a specific legislative proposal out of the study. It also doesn't go to say that they won't do it on the basis of our study. Uh, in terms of how the balance is reflected is in any sort of issue that we are investigating, we are aiming to collect data representative from both sides. So let's say if we are investigating, as an example, the secondary publication, right, it's not just to see whether there's harm on specific business models, but it's to see what could be the impact on the researchers themselves and on the research institutions themselves. So in any sort of issue that we study, we have inbuilt data collection to represent both perspectives, and not actually not only both perspectives, but also the perspectives of policymakers and the perspectives of end users, not only right holders and PAIs. So we are ensuring that balance just by, just by seeking out perspectives and data and hard evidence from both sides, not just one side. And that's in built into any question that we investigate within the study, which adds a lot of complexity um, to, to our study, but that's how we are uh, addressing this. In terms of how we how you could help us to receive as many replies as possible, uh, already this webinar hopefully is a good opportunity to obtain the links. I think that Stephen at, at some point towards the end uh, will share two QR links that you can take and disseminate with your networks. We're also following up. Um, we're investing a lot of follow-up efforts into, into um, reaching out to people and networks via email, via telephone. So if you do get a call or an email from our survey uh, team, um, please do ask them questions because uh, they will be providing you with links with standard texts that you can use to share the survey link with your members. Um, if you would like, if you haven't yet been contacted by the study team and you would like to uh, participate in the dissemination, please feel free to drop me an email. I will put you in touch with the survey team and they can really walk you through, give you all of the resources that we have to make it as easy for you as possible to disseminate the survey within your networks. Thank you. That, that's super helpful. I think actually one question that, that came out of that, and I think that that point about making sure that all, all perspectives that are heard is, is a really, you know, it's a really valuable one. And and actually, these efforts to to um, to reach out and the time that you're you're giving now in order to to help maximise the 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 input from the field is in, important. Um, and you know, our job is to make sure that that people feel like they can feed in and that their frustrations are things that aren't working, where simply they're not able to support research and education in the way they would like. That this is heard. Um, you, you mentioned talking to policymakers. I'm not sure if you you can share this. Are you? Are you also talking to um to education policy makers, to research policy makers? Because obviously, I don't know, copyright itself is not a goal. Copyright is a tool. Education and research are goals. And so it, it, you, you'll be talking to that wider range of people. 
Exactly, precisely. We are, uh, so within task one, we've already been speaking to policymakers mainly aimed at copyright, like policymakers responsible for copyright, since that task was aimed at taking stock of the national copyright framework. But the survey for policymakers is aimed at, let's say, four subgroups. So we're reaching out to research policymakers, so also research funders, ministries of education. Same for research. We have sent a survey to uh, ministries of education and research, et cetera. Likewise, with the cultural sector, where we have a specific section uh, from the perspective of cultural policy, policy rather than from the perspective of copyright. And then, of course, the fourth uh, sub-target group are the copyright policymakers. So yes, indeed, we do realize that copyright sometimes can live a bit on its own in terms of po policy making, but it's really important that the interaction is there and that we explore how much of the of the interaction is there between copyright and let's say educational policies, copyright and research policies, is that taken into account? What are the perspectives of those vertical, uh, let's say policymakers, how they, how they see these access to knowledge issues? So, we really are putting a lot of effort into obtaining those survey responses, but of course we will be following up if we don't receive enough survey responses by phone to reach out to at least one, let's say educational policymaker, research policymaker per cultural policymaker per country to obtain those perspectives. That, 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 that's really positive to hear. And I think I, I know that's always our, our concern that when a discussion is framed in terms of copyright, it's all about providing balance or making sure that there is sufficient financial incentive to make something available. Whereas that just doesn't, that doesn't always take account of, well, is this actually a good outcome for research and education? So that's really positive. Um, so we've only got a couple of minutes left. So what I will do is I will switch over to my slides um, in order to share those QR codes with you. So those should be coming up on the screen. Those should be up on the screen now. Um, hopefully you can see them. So what you have here, as I said, there's the, the QR code for the um, survey about institutions, and that's libraries, research centres, universities, museums, archives, it's the full range, and, and, and you can obviously choose who, who you want to, who you represent in that space. And then secondly, the one for individuals. So as I said, these are really rich surveys. Um, as promised at the beginning, we, we have created a um, an overview, just we, we copied out all the questions into a document, and so we'll be sharing those because I'm conscious that when people go into a survey, they often like to know where they're going with it first. And, and that, I don't know, so hopefully that, that makes it easier and makes it increases the number of people who, who feel willing and able to 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 actually respond to this. Um, but other than that, I just want to give a final chance if anyone has any questions. I'm not seeing anything, any final words from you, Odonis? Just to thank everyone for your, for your time. Thank you so much, Stephen, for helping to disseminate the survey. I'm really, really grateful. And indeed, your, your perspectives and your input is what will make the survey rich with practical on the ground issues and opportunities. Um, we do have one raised hand, so I'm just going to, I'll give Maya. Yeah, thank you very much for a very good presentation. I will just use the opportunity because a couple of people are listening from Slovenia. If anybody wants additional information and questions from public interest institution, I'm Knowledge Rights 21 National Coordinator and I'm cooperating with you uh, on this study. So my doors are open next week. I will also send an email in Open Science. So welcome for questions and also from other countries if your representatives are on holidays. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you so much, Maya. Great. So with that, I just want to say thank you to everyone for coming along. Um, we'll get the recording up as quickly as possible. We will share those overviews of, of what's in those surveys to make it easy to respond. Um, we'll also share Ordone's um, PowerPoint. But first, just primarily thank you, Ordone, for leading this through. I think we're, we're conscious of quite how massive a, a, a task it is and quite how ambitious it's been. And, and it's not, I don't know, technically and politically ambitious. So I know it's a big thing to take on, but we're, we're grateful that you've done it. Thank you so much, Stephen. And thank you so much, everyone, for listening in and contributing. Great. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye.